After voting to acquit Trump for the second time in his one-term presidency, Senator McConnell released an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal arguing that while Trump bears moral responsibility for the insurrection on January 6th, the Constitution prohibits Congress from impeaching a private citizen. Now, he'd just like to move on. He wants to focus on the future of the GOP, which to him is strictly electability, whether Trump approves or not. Democratic strategist and owner of JC Strategies, Jennifer Holdsworth Carp, and senior director of policy at the Conservative Partnership Institute, Rachel Bovard, they join us now to discuss. Rachel, let me start with you. Really interesting, frankly, the most interesting comments to me were what McConnell was talking about in terms of the future of the GOP making it very clear that while he voted to acquit, does not think that Trump is the future, saying that he might even recruit candidates who may, you know, go against the former president. What do you make of this, given the dynamics of the GOP primary situation and how McConnell conceives of himself as a leader within the party? Well, I think it's very clear that Mitch McConnell is not leading the Republican Party right now. Uh, but broadly speaking, you know, McConnell has one speed and it's accumulating power for himself. Mm -hmm. So when he talks about you know, who he's gonna recruit as candidates, he has one metric and is, it is if they're going to do what he says. This has always been true and it always shocks me that no one in DC really talks about McConnell's actually poor track record of picking candidates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he pushed Martha McSally, lost in Arizona, pushed Kelly Loeffler over Doug Collins in Arizona, or um, in, sorry, in Georgia. <laughs> lost yeah. there as well. Uh, you know, he's back to string of losers. He backed Arlen Specter over Pat Toomey, Bob Bennett over Mike Lee, Charlie Crist over uh, Marco Rubio. All the way down, there's a number of senators that wouldn't be here wow. if McConnell's picks had actually won. So he's, look, he doesn't look for electability. He looks for sort of pawns uh, that will not challenge him. That's his criteria. Mm. That's Very interesting. interesting. Jen, what do you make of McConnell's moves here? Because I think Rachel's assessment that, look, he has no values other than accumulating power for himself specifically. So what do you think of his various chess moves here, kind of floating to the press, I might vote to convict, then ultimately voting to acquit, but then saying, yeah, but he's morally responsible and um, signaling that he wants to move on from Trump? Yeah, he's a moral jellyfish. And I couldn't agree more that every single decision he makes is about accumulating power for himself. That's why he was uh, best friends with Trump when he was in office. That's why he's turning on him now that he has marginally less power that he's out of office. So there's no question that the decisions that he uh, uh, is going to make is going to benefit him. Now, I think it's interesting that he's taking a page out of Nancy Pelosi's communication book, which is win, baby, win, right? If you're mm -hmm. on Trump's side, great. If you're not on Trump's side, great. We just want to see you win the election. I don't think it's going to be a successful strategy. I think Republicans are going to have major problems going into 2022. Yeah, I, you know, I'm really torn on this. I really don't know. Rachel, this is an interesting thing I saw, too. I don't understand McConnell's calculus here because despite, you know, what he did, he still voted to, you know, acquit, but he's trying to have his cake and eat it, too. Lindsey Graham over the weekend said that McConnell was going to have trouble maintaining his status as majority leader. And Lindsey Graham is not some, like, Trumpite. So is McConnell actually in trouble here? Like, has he made his career, you know, future of the GOP exactly? Like, is he screwed? What, what's happening exactly within these dynamics? I think this might be the only time I've ever publicly praised Lindsey Graham for anything, but I think he was <laughs> completely right. Like if McConnell's put his conference in a really bad spot, but at the end of the day, he will remain leader if they allow him, right? Mm -hmm. He remains leader because the Republican conference chooses that and doesn't challenge him. And again, I think that there's so much daylight between where McConnell is and where the base of the Republican party is, the base is. And I think people are waking up to that, but it requires them to do something about it. And until they do, they can complain about him all they want, but it's incumbent upon them to actually fix the situation. Yeah, I agree. Jen, lay out for us how you see the future landscape for the Republican Party. Two interesting pieces of data. One is that while, you know, the overall, I mean, I think it's like 70 percent of Republicans want Trump to be a major figure in the party. There is a significant chunk that does not in addition, um, support for third party has never been higher. And all of the increase is coming from Republicans who are disgusted with the Republican Party right now. I mean, even if you have an erosion of a few points of people who are no longer partisan Republican voters who are willing to vote for Democrats, that can be a disaster for the Republican Party. Yeah, it's Republicans in disarray, which is a title that's usually <laughs> aptly assigned to the Democratic Party. But uh, we have our proverbial act together for the moment. I'm not entirely sure it's going to last that long. Uh, but I think that 
if the Republican Party fractures, which it looks like it's going to, they're going to have significant issues going into 2022, 2024 and beyond. Now, if they manage to keep it together, if they manage to keep a coalition, I think that that actually helps the Democrats because you're going to have a significant number of self-described moderate or centrist Republicans peel off and vote for the Democrats. Now, I agree there's never been a more ripe time for a third party to emerge and one that's actually towards the center, which is what a lot of those voters are clamoring for. Anytime we've seen a, a sort of fracture in a party over the last decade and a half, it's been on either side. Uh, of the extreme of both the Democratic and the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So if you see a party emerge that's more towards the center, that I think might be difficult for Democrats to capitalize on because more centrist Republicans are going to gravitate towards that party, even if they're not having successes, because it's going to seem like a moral victory to them. So either way, I think the Republicans have a major party, a major problem mm. headed into the midterms. I generally agree. Rachel, I'm curious for what you think, because, look, there's no question that, you know, that uh, Trump is the most popular figure in the Republican Party, has a hold on that party for many years to come. But there's also no question that there's a small, pretty small, actually, around maybe 15 to 20 percent of the party who does not like Trump. Many of them voted for Biden in the general election, and many of them may leave for all time to come, or maybe they just find a place in the Democratic Party, or many ways they might support a third party. How do you heal that type of schism? What exactly does that look like? Well, I think that, you know, us DC types tend to, you know, look at Trump and say, you know, Trump the demagogue is what needs to be purged from the Republican Party. But I think it's a mistake because, well, I mean, that is an, could be an accurate view. But the mistake sure. here is that what people are responding to were Trump's policies. And that's where mm -hmm. the broad center of the base is. I think they cling to Trump as a personality, but a lot of it was about his policies as well. So the candidates who are going to win here are those who aren't sort of, you know, cultishly clinging to Trump, but really trying to take his policies forward. I think that's going to define the Republican Party in 2022, because that's what really Mitch McConnell's doing here, right? He's saying he's, he's putting it all on Trump, but in reality, what he wants is a party that doesn't represent anything Trump ran on. He wants to put the party back into that chamber of commerce box, you know, where all we care about is, you know, war yes. and tax cuts for corporations. So I think any candidate that is able to actually thread the needle of moving beyond that while shedding sort of the, you know, mm. parts of Trump that were difficult to deal with, I think that is going to be who wins in 2022. I just yeah. think that he's made that impossible. I just don't think it's that possible. there's a needle to thread <laughs> yeah. anymore. I yeah. really I mean, truly, I really do think with this with this last act with Stop the Steal and the insurrection, he's made it impossible to, you know, align with him from a policy perspective, but not from a moral perspective. You can't you can't pull it off anymore. But we shall see what this year is going to bring in the years to come. Ladies, stick with us. We're going to have more Team Rising right after this.